Good morning, church. Welcome, everyone. And the guests with us are thrilled to work here. Uh, it's, we have uh, some musical changes over here. Well, some of it's a little change, but uh, we have a bigger change. I'll talk about that in a second. First of all, uh, Wendy and Carol Porter are taking a, a weekend off. Much deserved. So Jim is at the piano today. Uh, he's not playing in the yard in the morning. And back here, that's not Carol, that's Virginia Lucas. And we know Virginia from uh, Church of Zoom, of course. And, uh, we're, we're, we're grateful that you could come today, so thank you. Uh, speaking of Church of Serving, the World Warning Center is officially closed down. The Warning Center is closed now? It was last night. Yeah, so uh, just uh, for your information, it's closed down for the summer months. And we'll, Lord willing, we'll open again in that. In the fall. Uh, where's my audio visual guy? Oh, he's over here. Okay, here comes the announcement slides. First of all, again, to encourage you to do some informal connections with folks. There's a whole bunch of things listed there. Uh, if you have a, a hobby or an interest, uh, why not bring uh, someone new with you and, and to share the time together? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, this is a good one. Uh, the Strand Theater held uh, showings of the Jesus Revolution, and whoa, 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 get back there! <laughs> um, and anyway, if if you have seen the movie or you wish you had, uh, and you're certainly invited to an informal discussion, and you can talk to Janet about that, uh, where that location is. Um, if you haven't seen it, I hope you all get a chance. It is an amazing story. And we met someone at the theater, Laura and I, who sat behind us. He was there. And it was really cool. In California. Yeah, he was in California. And then he went to Sweden and just started a, a Bible school there. So that was really, that was really cool to me. And he, was, he was taking pictures of the screen in different places because he had been there. It was really interesting. Next. Family camping, August 4th and 7th. That's the Civic Long weekend in August, so uh, if you'd like to come and be a part of that, um, first of all, you get a site, and you can come on. Next. Oh, yes. VBS is coming on August 14th to 18th. Soon we will be pestering you all for volunteerism and other things, so uh, just uh, market your calendars and, and make sure that young people uh, know that it's on. And registration is open, right? Yes, registration is open online, so uh, sign up early. Next. Or is that? That's it? But Grant, there's no refreshment slide. Why is that? <laughs> um, anyway, there are refreshments today. Uh, after service, we encourage you to come back through that door into the parlor and just to get to know each other and to, uh, enjoy some refreshments. Let's begin our time of worship together with prayer. Let's pray. O God, whose rains fall upon the just and the unjust, hear our prayer. You set your rainbow in the clouds as a sign of the covenant you made with all earth's creatures. You promised that whenever the bow was in the heavens, you would look upon it and remember the bond between us. Unlike yours, our memory fades. Though we too have a sign by which we remember, the sign of an empty tomb, and we often forget whose we are. But now, in gathering here, we remember well. Look upon us, come upon us, O God. Send your promise by your Spirit. Look upon us, come upon us, O God. Send your promise by your Spirit. May it descend on all of us like a dove. Amen. Good morning all. Please join me in a call to worship when we welcome and greet each other to the household of God. I welcome you 
in the name of the one who was and is and ever shall be, I greet you. I embrace you in the name of the one who lived and died and rose again. I receive you. watching too much news and I can stir in and kind of worked up when you hear about this morning it was war, civil war breaking out again in Sudan. There's those machinations of China in the background, North Korea, Putin, uh, the climate change, and I start getting a little distressed about what's going to become of our world. And when that happens, I love to see songs that we're going to sing next or read verses that remind me Jesus is the King of Kings, the ruler of rulers, the creator and owner of this planet and this world. And nothing can happen unless God allows it. And when it's done, he says, that's it. It's over. Putin and all these guys are done. God's in control. So I can just start relaxing because I know it's going to be okay. So please stand and join me as we sing. Rejoice, the Lord is King. <laughs>
16. So any of you who like brought your Bibles or like to hold a Bible or some of the cues, it's Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also, my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol or let your faithful ones see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Please join me for our litany of affirmation. We must obey God rather than human authority. God, be glory and forever and ever. The God of our fathers and mothers raised Jesus, who was killed by hanging on a cross. God, be glory and God exalted him at God's right hand as leader and savior. To God be glory in him forever and ever. Christ brings repentance and forgiveness of sins. To God be glory in him forever and ever. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey. To God be glory in him. Spirit of God bears witness to the presentation of our tithes and offerings, taking what is a material good and making them a sacred offering unto God. As we have presented our gifts here at the front this morning, we also look for that same Spirit to enter our worldly lives and turn us into living sacred sacrifices to God. Let us therefore prepare our hearts as we have prepared our gifts. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for so many things, but we thank you for the wonderful joy and privilege of participating in your work in this community and even beyond. Bless the gifts we present today. Use them for your work in your kingdom. And continue, we pray most of all, to continue to work in our lives. Through Christ our Lord. We ask the children to come forward with their godly play leaders. Today in godly play, we'll hear the story of Jonah, a backward prophet, doing everything wrong, yet everything comes out right except his own relationship with God. We are left finishing the story ourselves, wondering what happened to Jonah next. He desperately tries to avoid doing what God has called him to do. Why? Do our song first. Today's children's song is Every Move I Make.
are somewhere. I don't know. They're hiding downstairs already, I guess. You know whose favorite song that is, Melody and Oscar? Whose song, favorite song is that? Nana, it's Nana's favorite song because they go Nana. Nana. <laughs> Well, what if I were to tell you something very, very strange, very, very rare? I wonder if you would believe me. Hmm. I wonder if you would believe me if I told you something really unusual. Are you ready for this? I, me, I have pet a porcupine. I have had a porcupine, a real live porcupine. Now, do you believe me? No, I got one yes. My own granddaughter said no. Anybody have, what do you think? Did I pet the porcupine? Maybe. Oh, that's sitting on the fence. That's a, you know. Well, I have, but how are we going to prove that I did? Yeah, yes. Bring the porcupine here. No, we don't do that. Don't in skin, don't touch it. A video or a picture, which I do have, by the way, not the video or the picture. I thought of another way. What if I had someone who saw me do it? Someone that you all know of. And I asked that person if they saw me actually pet the porcupine. Would that be good enough? Maybe? Yeah. Laura? Yeah. Have I pet a porcupine? Yes, you have. Yes, I have. Yeah. It was in Alaska, by the way. We went to an animal refuge center and they had a pet porcupine. And the trick with petting a porcupine is you got to do it carefully. <laughs> actually, you pet with the spine. Not against the monster, but with it. And it, it liked it. It liked being pet, the, the porcupine. I can't remember its name. And baby porcupines are born with quills. Yeah, baby porcupines are born with quills. Poor mom. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, the disciples long ago had a story to tell that sounded really incredible. They told people that Jesus had risen from the dead. And there were a lot of people who didn't believe them. But you know what? They were able to point to other witnesses who had seen Jesus alive around. And do you know how many there were? 500 witnesses. Is that good enough? 500 people said they saw Jesus rise from the dead. Is that good enough? You're going to believe me about the porcupine with one witness. 500 is pretty incredible, isn't it? I think so. Are we good? Are we glad that we have those witnesses? I think so. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you did rise from the dead. We thank you that there were so many witnesses that saw that you had risen from the dead. We thank you for their testimony. We thank you for their witness. Help us to believe them when they tell us that he is risen. Amen.
and all the worship team is repositioning themselves. I just want to tell you that the same day I pet a porcupine, I pet a moose, and I got within two feet of a full-grown grizzly. There was a fence between us all. <laughs> Our gospel lesson, we're continuing through this amazing section of John. We're looking at John 20, verses 19 to 31. John 20, 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was, among, was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt but believe. And Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the gospel. Thanks be to God. during one of the saddest chapters of the Civil Rights Movement in the United States, 14-year-old Addie Mae Collins was buried in Birmingham, Alabama. The tragedy that brought on Addie's death was that she happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. You see, Addie was one of the victims of the infamous church bombing of a black church by white races. What transpired after Abby's funeral was to be expected. As a symbol now of the civil rights movement in the United States and a beloved daughter, for several years her family members and other friends made the sad pilgrimage to her grave to pray and leave flowers in her memory. In 1998, Abby's family made the decision to disinter her remains and rebury them in another cemetery. When the workers set about to dig up the remains, however, they made a shocking discovery. The grave was empty. As you can imagine, Adam's family were terribly distraught. Unfortunately, the record-keeping of the cemetery was poorly managed, and this left cemetery officials scrambling to try and figure out what happened to Adam's remains. It was certainly Sorry. Several possibilities were raised, like, well, maybe she got buried in the wrong place, or maybe she's under the wrong tombstone. And it's certainly a logical conclusion. However, unfortunately, after extensive investigations and record searches and efforts to probe failing memories of former cemetery workers, the answer to what happened to Abby's remains has never been answered. No one knows where her remains are. What is interesting, however, is that in all this speculation about what happened to Addie, one explanation for the absence of her remains has never, not even once, been proposed. Nobody, not even her family, have made the suggestion that Addie rose from the dead. 
and walked on the earth again. Every other explanation, like poor record keeping or a misplaced tombstone plate, was far more plausible than her rising from the dead and walking again. Over many years now, like many of you, I've watched those television shows like CSI or Bones or whatever that deal with the forensics of murder. And occasionally they have an episode on that show where a body goes missing and cannot be found. However, I've yet to see on any of these programs the conclusion put forward that the body had, the person had raised from the dead. I conclude from Audie's story and from what little I know about forensic science that an empty tomb by itself does not prove a resurrection. Something more substantive is needed to prove that someone had risen from the dead, and maybe that's a good starting point for us today. And it's certainly a timely subject given that we just celebrated Easter last week. So if I were to suggest to you this morning that someone we all know had risen from the dead, what would it take to convince you that that statement is true? Is, is my personal word enough to convince you that something miraculous has happened, something incredible has occurred? Well, let's be honest, no matter what credibility I have on all of you, it's a real a claim like that, like a resurrection, would probably need something a little more than just my word. We might conclude, as I was demonstrating with the children, that what we need is proof for proof of the resurrection is a witness, or two, or three, or as I mentioned, five hundred. However, this too can be somewhat inadequate, at least if it's only one or two. Because even if a thousand people saw that empty tomb, it does still doesn't mean that there was a resurrection. Besides, we might argue for more plausible and scientific explanations for what happened to their remains. Having heard a report about a resurrection, we might prefer to believe that the two or three who claimed that a resurrection occurred and there was an empty tomb are perhaps psychologically disturbed. Perhaps we think about it. they've been overcome so deeply by their grief, or maybe in their longing for their loved one, that it's just wishful thinking. Maybe their hopeful longing brought some sort of brought on some sort of fanciful hallucination. Such would have been our conclusion if Addie Mae Collins' family had began to tell everybody that Addie's remains are not there because she rose from the dead. The reality is that our collective human experience over countless centuries tells us that once you're dead, you're dead. When confronted with an empty tomb, anything else is more plausible than someone has risen from the dead. So knowing this logic and the reasonableness of our conclusions about an empty tomb, it is clear that to prove that a resurrection occurred, we need to meet a person who claimed to have risen. However, well, that too can cause problems. It's one thing for me personally to see the raised person, but what if I, if you were the one who saw that person and tried to convince me of what you saw? We struggle sometimes to believe someone who petted a porcupine, for example. Or someone who says they saw someone who's still alive, like Elvis, remember that? Everybody said Elvis was still alive. How many times have you heard from a friend or a neighbor or family member that they saw a famous person? What's the first words out of your mouth? First word, actually. Really? <laughs> The mere utterance of the word, really, <laughs> indicates that we're skeptical, aren't we? We might even ask, well, did you get a selfie? Did you get a, some kind of picture or an autograph? In other words, do you have any proof at all that you met this 
celebrity. You see, we are by our very nature skeptical creatures. And the more incredible the claim, the more skeptical we become. And so it is with this realization that I caution you to be a bit more compassionate to the Apostle Thomas. Or as he sometimes, unfairly, I think, referred to as Debbie Thomas. If we take into consideration what he saw and he experienced in the event of Jesus' death and burial, I think we'd be skeptical to him. To see someone you had loved and you had followed and you at least believed was God's special agent on earth be brutalized as he was on the cross was about as traumatic an event as you can imagine. Everyone understands that no one ever recovers from that nasty form of death. I ran across a funny little story about that. Marla J. Kiley is in the accounting department of a large insurance company, which was working on its year-end reports when the computers all went down. Big problem. An emergency call was put out to an assistance analyst. Busy with other troubleshooting, the man couldn't get there for about three hours. Yet, even then, several clerks cheered, He's here! Our Savior is here! With other words, the system analyst turned to leave. Panic, the account, accounting manager cried out, Where are you going? I'm leaving, the analyst said. I remember what they did to the last Savior. <laughs> Thomas knew what had happened. We cannot fault him for his skepticism. Also, we need to remember that when Jesus first appeared to the disciples, Thomas wasn't there. We're never told why he wasn't there. And any speculation as to his whereabouts is just that, speculation. So as the other disciples got a full face-to-face -face encounter with the risen Christ, Thomas missed them. Yet to his credit, Thomas does eventually rejoin the other disciples. After all, this group of disciples have become very close as a group. They shared a lot of similar experiences, and as we know, familiarity brings comfort, doesn't it? He may have thought at least these ten friends would understand his pain. Now imagine for a moment Thomas entering that upper room. Talk about jarring. As you can imagine, walking into the room with the rest of the disciples who have seen the risen Lord, what is the very first thing they tell them? They couldn't help themselves. In their joy and excitement, they just blurted out as a group, we have seen the Lord. We don't know the exact process Thomas' mind went through in processing this declaration and seeing the joy in the other disciples but the conclusion he comes to is very clear, isn't it? I won't believe it. Unless I see nails in the hands of the wounds in his hands, put my fingers in them, and place my hand in the wound of his side. Thomas is skeptical, isn't he? I, really, we can't blame him. He must have wondered what was going on in his friend's minds. Is this some kind of sick, cruel joke? If this occurred today, we might wonder what the disciples were smoking or drinking. <laughs> Perhaps they had been hallucinating. Or at the very least, they had seen a ghost. And almost certainly, the idea that they had seen a ghost was what was prompting Thomas to say that he wanted to place his finger in the wounds of his hands. Because you know what? You couldn't do that with a ghost. Dr. Gary Collins, who is a no, doctor has a doctorate in psychology. He's authored dozens of books on psychology. He was also one time the president of the Association of Psychologists in the United States. He dismissed the hallucination conclusion as not possible. Collins writes, hallucinations are individual occurrences. By their very nature, only one person can have a given hallucination at a time. 
They certainly aren't something that can be seen as a group of people. Neither is it possible that one person could somehow induce a hallucination in other people. Since hallucinations exist only in the subjective mind, personally, it's a personal thing, it is obvious that other people can't see it. Also, psychologists report that hallucinations are extremely rare. They are usually caused by something, like drugs or bodily, bodily deprivation. I have, for example, seen numerous people who are hallucinating in hospital after surgery, and I'm as guilty of that as anyone. My hallucinations were wild. My grandfather, for example, after a major surgery, woke up and believed that he was working for a large life insurance company while he was in the hospital, and that there was a great conspiracy going on around this insurance company. When his head finally cleared with the anesthetic, he said that he knew he was speaking nonsense, but he couldn't stop us. There was, however, no way that these disciples could have a hallucination, especially when hundreds of other people are documented as having seen the risen Jesus. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 tells us. Thomas was not a trained psychologist. He just simply knew that such a claim by his friends that Jesus had risen was totally inconsistent with our human experience. Just think for a moment the anguish that Thomas must have experienced that day. Not like the others, he loved Jesus very much. He had committed himself to following Jesus. Like the others, his vision of what he believed Jesus was trying to do for the Jewish people died with him on the cross. I wonder sometimes if the reason Thomas came back to the fellow, his fellow disciples was that in his anguish, he sought comfort and companionship. We have an expression, don't we? Misery loves company. However, instead of entering into a shared grief experience, he walks into a room full of excited and joyful people. It makes so little sense to him. However, it should be known again that what Thomas demands is no less than what the others received already. Thomas wants an encounter himself with the risen Christ, but more than that, he wants the assurance that Jesus isn't just some ghostly apparition. Therefore, what happens? Suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. He said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put your hand in the wound of my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Say things change for Thomas would be an understatement. He sees Jesus. He doesn't touch him, by the way, as far as we know. He hears his offer. He shouts out, my God, my Lord and my God. When confronted by the risen Christ, standing in front of him, there's only one conclusion he could make. He is risen. The empty tomb is not enough to believe, but seeing Jesus is more than enough for him. Then Jesus says something that I believe is more for us than it was for Thomas. You believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who haven't seen me and believe anyway. That's clearly a statement that applies to us, isn't it? The disciples and hundreds of others, the Bible says, had seen the risen Christ and had the privilege of the undeniable physical proof. What therefore do you and I have? How can we believe and be blessed? John writes in verse 31, But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you will have life. What we have is the testimony of those who saw Him, which again, as I mentioned, numbered in the hundreds. We have the evidence of how the resurrection changed the disciples' lives and also the whole course of history. 
J.P. Moreland, Ph.D., states that the disciples were willing to die for something they had seen with their own eyes and touched with their own hands. They were in a unique position not to just believe Jesus rose from the dead, but to know for sure. And when you've got 11 credible people with no ulterior motive, with nothing to gain but really a whole lot to lose, who all agree they saw something, they observed something with their eyes, you're going to have a lot of difficulty explaining it away, aren't you? The disciples, including Thomas, were all murdered for teaching that Jesus had risen from the dead. They claim to have seen him, talk with him. They, they claim they ate with him. If they were not absolutely sure of what they had seen, they would never have let themselves be tortured to death for proclaiming the resurrection at heaven. It just wouldn't do it. We also have significant skeptics coming to faith after seeing the risen Christ. The Apostle Paul is the most widely known. But also James, the brother of Jesus, you may not know this, who in the Gospels is reported to have been embarrassed by his brother Jesus. Later, however, Josephus, the historian, tells us that James, the brother of Jesus, who was the leader of the Jerusalem church, was stoned to death because of his belief in his brother. Why did James' life change? Paul tells us the resurrected Jesus appeared to him. How did he, Paul go from persecuting the church to being its most prolific scholar and church planter among the Gentiles? The evidence is overwhelming and the scholarship is quite significant. The resurrection of Jesus happened. He was seen by hundreds. What more do we need? Why can't we believe? Where's our faith? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Yes. So I ask you, why not believe and be blessed? Let us pray. God of peace and God of glory, your gentle use of power continually amazes us. When you would have had most reason to scorn us, you have accepted us. When you had the greatest reason to spite us, you forgave us. When you had infinite reason to forget us, you remembered us. And you have remembered us with such compassion. When we've locked ourselves away in the upper rooms of our lives, you have sent your presence into our midst for the word of peace. Not blame, not accusation, not condemnation, but peace. You send us peace so that we can, you can send us out from our hiding places with strength and power. And all you ask is that we believe. However, believing does not come easily to us. A little bit of Thomas's doubt is still within us, testing ourselves as much as you. Do we believe that we can do as you ask us despite the risk? Do we understand that there will be risks? In some places of our world, to believe would endanger our very lives. What if here in this country and in this time, when you are sending us out into the world, what are you asking us to leave behind? Are we able, O Lord? We who have not seen, though we believe, shall we be able to act upon our belief? God of peace, God of glory, on your people pour your power. Comfort us in our doubting and strengthen us in our believing. Help us to hold nothing back but to lay it all at your feet. 
from doubt to certainty, from our weakness to our strength, from humility to our pride, from our patience to your anxiety, we give it all to you, O oh God. Transform it. Make our lives new. And despite our fear and trembling, send us and remind us every day that wherever we shall go in your name, you shall go before us, lighting the path that we should tread. Gracious Lord, we ask your blessing on those that are near and dear in our hearts who are struggling this day. You know the burdens that we carry. And so, Father, we offer them to you so that we may be made lighter. We know, Father, that you will intervene. You will care and you will comfort. Help us to trust in that work. Now, Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your salvation. We offer our prayer and our lives in the name of Jesus. You taught us to pray to God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. I invite you to stand as we sing together our closing uh, song, Always.
glad. And the Christ whom you've never seen will appear. 